Hello and welcome to Friends of Tracking. My name is Laurie Shaw and this is the third in a series of video tutorials looking at how you can get started working with and analyzing player tracking data in football. So in part one, we looked at how to read in and manipulate the tracking and event data that Metrica Sports have kindly made publicly available. I showed you how to visualize the data uh, and we looked at how to add, use the tracking data to add context to uh, shot maps and passing maps. In part two, we delved a little bit deeper into the data. Uh, we looked at how to measure player velocities and we created some bespoke physical summary reports for players throughout the course of a, of a match. Today, we're gonna to move on to a more advanced modeling topic, and I'm gonna show you how to create your own pitch control model in Python. And this will take us um, close to some of the cutting edge research that's been done in football analytics over the last few years. All the code um, can be found in the Friends of Tracking GitHub repository, um, and the Metrica data that we'll analyze today uh, can be found in uh, their GitHub repository. In his Friends of Tracking video lecture, William Spearman defined pitch control at a given location as being the probability that a player or a team will gain control of the ball if it moves directly from its current position to that location. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to build your own pitch control model um, based on some of the work that Will published in his paper, um, Beyond Expected Goals, um, at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference in 2018. So the basic question that pitch control models seek to answer um, is what options are available um, to the player on the ball? Or to put it another way, where can that player pass the ball such that his team are likely to retain possession of it? I've plotted here an instant from a game. Um, so the dots show the positions of all the players uh, and the little arrows show you um, where they were running at that instant. So the longer the arrow, the faster they were moving. And player 20 in the, in the blue team who are shooting from right to left is in possession of the ball. So in terms of passing options, you can see that you know, given the motion of, of all the teams from right to left, you know, perhaps he has some passing options um, uh, up in the top left-hand corner of the field here, and perhaps there are some passing options down here. Pitch control models enable you to quantify these options directly. So the, the red regions on the field now indicate the areas in which the red team are likely to gain control of the ball if player 20 was to pass the ball to those locations, whereas the blue regions indicate the areas in which the blue team was likely to retain control of the ball if the ball was passed to those locations. So you can see, for example, that there are passing options down the lower part of the field here and perhaps in the, in the upper part of the field here or back towards um, his own goal. And the model captures not only the instantaneous positions of players, but also where they're running. So if a player is moving quickly, they're much more likely to um, control the space that they're moving into rather than the space that they currently occupy. It's also worth noting that this model says nothing about the value of the uh, potential pass or of moving the ball to a given location in the field. It just shows you where the team is likely to retain possession of the ball. Now, if we want to build a pitch control model, um, there are essentially three things that we need to calculate. For a given location on the pitch, uh, we need to calculate how long would it take for the ball to arrive at that location from its current position. Uh, we then need to also calculate how long it might take for every player on the field to arrive at that location so that they, they can attempt to control the ball. And then we need to calculate the total probability that each team or the individual players will control the ball um, after both they and it has arrived at the location. And if we want to calculate a, a full pitch control surface like the one I just showed, we need to repeat these calculations for all locations on the pitch. So let's first look at um, the, the time it takes the ball to arrive at a given location on the field. So in the example that I just showed, player 20 was in, in possession of the ball at this start location here. 
And let's imagine that he wants to move the ball to pass it to this end position here, um, which is a, a distance of about 21 meters. Now, there are many ways of, of modeling the potential trajectory of the ball from the start position to the end position. Um, but in this model, we're simply going to assume that the ball travels at a constant speed of 15 meters per second, such that it takes um, 21 meters divided by 15 meters per second, which is 1.4 seconds to arrive at the end position. So let's now look at how long it would take each of the players to arrive um, at the target position for the ball, given their initial position and velocity at the moment that um, the pass is played. Um, and in this model, um, there are a number of key assumptions. Uh, the first is that players have a maximum speed of five meters per second. Um, and that's not to say that's the maximum speed they can go at. It's, I think it's more of an estimate of the, the maximum speed they're likely to be going at if they're seeking to control the ball. Um, they also have a maximum acceleration of seven meters per second per second. And we also assume that players will take um, or attempt to take the fastest possible uh, path to the target location. And this is not at all uh, an easy problem to solve exactly. For the purpose of the model that we're going to build today, um, we're going to adopt a very simple approximation for calculating player arrival time. Um, this approximation is a two-step process. In the first step, uh, we'll assume that there is an initial reaction period of 0.7 seconds, which is approximately the amount of time it would take a player moving at their maximum speed to come to a complete halt. Um, and during this reaction period, we're going to assume that every player continues along their current trajectory um, without changing their speed or direction. After 0.7 seconds, we'll then assume that um, each player runs directly towards the target location at their maximum speed of five meters per second. So you can see this is a very rough approximation. So let's look at the, the two closest players to the target location in our example. Um, we have player four um, on the red team and player 24 on the blue team. And again, the arrows indicate the, the velocities of each player at the moment that the pass is played. And so here are the trajectories that the players would take under our simple approximate process. The little dots indicate where the player would be um, after their initial reaction time. So for the first 0.7 seconds, player four carries, along, carries on along his initial trajectory. And then after 0.7 seconds, turns and runs at his maximum speed of five meters per second towards the, towards the target location. Player 24 was essentially already moving in the right direction. So just continues along his path for the reaction period. And then again, moves on to the target location at his maximum speed. And in this calculation, it would take player four about two seconds to get from his starting location to the target location and player 24, one and a half seconds. So we've calculated how long it would take a player and the ball to get to the target location. Um, but what about how long it would take for each player to actually control the ball? Now in William's model, he assumes that players that are in the vicinity of the ball have within a given time interval, delta T, a probability of controlling the ball um, of lambda multiplied by delta t, where lambda is essentially a free parameter in his model that determines how quickly footballers tend to control the ball. And Will suggests using a value of 4.3 inverse seconds, which is basically like saying it typically takes uh, about 0.25 seconds for a player to control the ball. And indeed, if you look at the cumulative distribution function, which gives you the probability that a player will control the ball within a given period of time, you can see that 90% of the time, a player will have controlled the ball in, in, in just over half a second or so. So let's go back to our example uh, and look again at the, the two players that start off uh, closest to the, uh, the target location, player four in the red team and player 24 in the blue team. And we've already calculated that the ball will take 1.4 seconds to arrive at the target location um, after the moment the pass is played. Uh, player 24 arrives very shortly after, um, takes him 1.5 seconds to arrive. Uh, and player 4 arrives after 2 seconds. And so the, the, this chart on the right shows you the probability 
that the ball is controlled uh, by one or the other of the players as a function of time since the pass is played. So the blue line shows the probability as a function of time that player 24 will control the ball and the red line shows the probability that player four will control the ball and the black line shows the total probability that one or other of the players will control the ball. Um, prior to one and a half seconds, the, the probability that the ball has been controlled is zero because neither player has arrived at the target location. Player 24 arrives after 1.5 seconds and then has the opportunity to attempt to control the ball unopposed um, for half a second before player four arrives. And you can see at the moment that player four arrives, there's already a, just under a 90% chance that player 24 will have already controlled the ball. Beyond that, the players compete to control the ball such that by two and a half seconds after the pass is made, it's very likely that one or the other will control the ball. And the final probability is about 0.93 that player 24 will have controlled the ball and 0 .7, 0.07 that uh, player four will have controlled it. But this all assumes that we know exactly when each player will arrive at the target location. But as Will described uh, in his lecture, his model incorporates into it some uncertainty uh, in the player arrival time, which he models um, using a sigmoid distribution with a standard deviation of 0.45 seconds. And if we incorporate this into our model, we see that the, the probability that the ball is controlled by either player changes significantly. And the reason for this is that the ball is assumed to arrive exactly after 1.4 seconds. But now that there's some uncertainty in the arrival time of the players, there's, a, there's actually less of a window in which player 24 can control the ball uh, unopposed, such that his final probability that he uh, ends up controlling the ball is reduced from 0.93 to 0.7, and the probability that player 4 controls the ball increases correspondingly to about uh, 0.3. So the way in which we calculate the full pitch control surface is to essentially to sort of break the, uh, the, the field down into a grid of little pixels. And then within each pixel, we calculate the, the time that it would take the ball to arrive from its current location, the time it would take all the players to arrive along with the associated uncertainty, and then the probability that each player would be able to control the ball and therefore each team would be able to control the ball. Uh, and then we repeat that by moving across the grid and, and calculating it in every single pixel. If we look at the pass that player 20 actually made, you can see that the pitch control model suggests that the probability of the pass success was 0.7. Um, and in this case, it was indeed uh, successful and player 24 received it and was able to gain control. So what I'm going to do now is step back into Python and give you a quick overview um, as to how all this was implemented in the code. And then we'll look through some, some other examples. So here we are back in Spider, and I'm now gonna go through some of the code um, that I've written to implement the model that we've just reviewed. As I said at the beginning, all this code is available on the uh, Friends of Tracking GitHub repository. And you'll see that I've added um, a new script lesson six, which goes through the examples that we're going to review now, and a new modu module, Metrica Pitch Control, which implements the, the pitch control model. So the first thing, let's import the modules that we're going to need. And then as before, let's read in the data, um, the tracking and the event data, convert the coordinate system to, uh, to metric coordinates as we did in previous tutorials, and then also reverse the direction of play such that the home team is always attacking from right to left, uh, whether it be the first half or the second half. So let's read in all the data. Then as we did in the, in the last tutorial, let's calculate the player velocities, which are of course an important component of the pitch control model. Okay, so now that we've done that, what we're going to do is look at the passes that lead up to one of the goals in this match and take a look at what the pitch control services look like and then dig into the code and see how it, how it works. So let's first identify all the shots in the match from the event data and 
identify which of those shots resulted in goals. So if we take a look at that data frame, you'll see that there were five goals. And we're going to look in particular at the second goal, which was scored by the away team um, and has an event ID 823. So let's plot the three passes that lead up to that goal. So we're going to use the plot events function that we've seen previously, plot the uh, events 820 to 823. Right, so here we can see player 21 passed to player 19, passed to player 23, who's provided the assist for player 24 to score the goal. So let's first plot the pitch control field at the instant at which player 21 makes this pass here. So the first thing we need to do to do that is first to read in some of the parameters that the model requires. So this just calls a, a function that stores those parameters in metric pitch control. Let's run that. See if we print that out, you can see it stores things like the maximum player speed, which is five meters per second. Um, some of the parameters that we discussed, like the control parameter and the uncertainty in time to arrival. And then some other parameters down here that determine just how the model calculates how the code calculates the model. So the function that calculates the pitch control surface is called generate pitch control for event. This takes in uh, an event ID, which case this case 820, which corresponds to the, uh, the pass from player 20. The events data frame, then the data frames for the tracking data for the home team and the away team, the model parameters, um, and then some inputs relating to the field dimensions and how fine the grid that you want to calculate the pitch control surface on. So let's look at what this function actually looks like in the uh, pitch control module. So quickly stepping through some of the code, what it's doing here is just finding the relevant frame for the event, figuring out which team was in possession of the ball, i.e. which team made the pass, the start location of the ball, then as discussed before, we calculate the pitch control surface over a grid. Um, so these lines set that grid up. And then these lines here um, essentially initialize the model by collecting together all the relevant information that we need about the players in order to calculate the pitch control surface. So if you look at what this initialize players function is doing up here, takes in a team uh, tracking, a row of the tracking uh, data, um, the team name, which case would be home and away, and then that parameters dictionary, um, identifies the, um, the player jerseys, and then iterates through these players and sets up a, uh, an object that's called team player that holds information about their velocity and, um, and their current position and some other functions that we'll use like time to intercept. And this is the arrival time a calculation, and this is the, the probability that they can control the ball within a different window, as we discussed when we were going through the model. Um, and this is all contained in the class called player. And so it's just a way of just kind of collecting together all the information that we need into a single data structure so that we can access this easily when we calculate the model. So if you go back down to the main function, you'll see this, the last part of it essentially iterates over the the grid that covers the pitch and calculates the pitch control at each of those in each of those grid cells so the target position becomes sort of the positions of those little pixels and then it calls this function calculate pitch control at target to to calculate the actual um, value of the pitch control for the attacking team at that location if we take a look at this function So this is really the, the core of the, um, of the calculation. The first thing it does is calculate the ball travel time, which you can see is, is determined to be the, the distance from between the start position and the end position divided by the average ball speed, which we set to 15 meters per second as discussed earlier. So these next two lines calculate the expected arrival time um, of each player in the attacking team and the defending team. And then the main part of the calculation essentially is this loop here, which iteratively solves the probability that a team, a player in the attacking team or in the defending team is going to control the ball 
when it arrives at the target location. And I won't go through this in a huge amount of detail, but you should be able to see how this corresponds to the calculation that we reviewed earlier. Okay, so let's go back and actually generate the pitch control surfaces for the three passes that lead up to this goal. So this line here of code will calculate the pitch control surface for event 820, which is the first pass in the sequence. Let's go ahead and run those. Takes a, a few seconds for it to complete the calculation. And here we are. So player 21 makes this long pass out to the right wing. Um, the you can see that it's a, a pass into a region shaded blue, which means that the, the blue team were very likely to retain possession of the ball. And indeed, if you look down at this bottom left-hand corner, you can see the actual value of the pitch control surface appear as I move the cursor around the field. So if I look at the pass location, the, the value is 0.65. So there's about a two in three chance that the pass would be successful. Um, if I move the cursor over here, you can see it's one. So if the player was to pass the ball back to this area, the blue team would be almost guaranteed to retain control of the ball. If I move it over here, it's 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 essentially zero. So if the player 21 had attempted to pass the ball here, they would almost certainly lost control. And you can see here that the main passing options available were sort of this region here, which are controlled by players 22 and 24, the long pass out to the right wing, or perhaps a, a pass across to player 20. But the now let's look at the next pass in the sequence. Again, let's calculate the pitch control surface. So player 19 now has control of the ball and clearly has a passing option into this area of space here, which player 23 is running into and has a bit of a head start over player three. And the, uh, the value of the pitch control surface here is about 0.78. So there's nearly a four or five chance that pass to this location would be successful. And of course, the opportunity to pass here is really made by the run made by player 23. So finally, let's look at the third pass, which is the assist. Generate the pitch control surface for that. Now, player 23 has moved into the box. His options really here are either have a shot at goal or to play it into this region here, which is uh, controlled by player 24, um, which is what he does probability the pass is successful is about 0.6. Um, and of course, it provides a clear shot on goal for player 24. So zooming out, you can see how the pitch control surfaces have summarized not only the, the probability of success of any given passing option, but also it's a nice way of visualizing what options were available to the player on the ball at any given instant. So next, Let's go through all the completed passes that the home team made throughout the match and calculate their success probability, the probability those passes would have been successful at the moment they were made um, as perceived by the model. And you may be wondering why I'm looking at the completed passes uh, rather than all the passes that the home team create, uh, attempted. The reason is that for passes that were unsuccessful, which were normally passes that were intercepted, or were very you know, far off target, it's quite difficult to determine who, what the target location was because the pass was unsuccessful. Um, there are ways around this, of course, but for now, we're just gonna look at the completed passes. So this line of code here just selects all the home passes from the, uh, from the event data. So we run that, you can see that there are, 543 of those passes. And what we're going to do now is loop through all of those passes, calculate, look at, identify the start position and the target position from the event data, and then run the pitch control model and calculate what the, the model thinks the, the, the success probability of that pass was at the instant it was made. So we can essentially begin to give an estimate of like how risky were the passes that the, the home team attempted. So let's run this part of line of code. And the results are going to be stored in this past success probability list. So 
So that's quite quick. And the reason why it's quick is it no longer has to go through this whole grid to produce uh, a surface for the entire pitch. It's just looking at the final location of the passes that were made. So let's now first make a, a quick histogram of the success probability of all these passes. So we're going to import uh, pyplot from matplotlib um, and then make a quick make a quick histogram. Let's run that. So this histogram shows the the number of passes um, that a home, the home team attempted as a function of the pass success probability. And you can see that the vast majority of the passes attempted by the home team were more than 90% likely to be successful. So presumably the, a lot of these are passes between defenders when there wasn't much pressure on the ball. Um, but there is a tail to, to, towards riskier passes and approximately 20 or 30 passes that um, had less than a 50% uh, success probability. So let's, let's look at these riskier passes in a little bit more detail and see, see what they are. So the first thing we're going to do is just sort the passes um, according to success probability and then identify just the risky passes. So those for which the pass success probability was less than, than 50%. So let's see what the risky passes look like. So there are um, 18 passes attempted by the home team that the pitch control model perceived as being less than 50% likely of being successful. And now that we've identified these passes and the events that correspond to them, let's plot them and see what those passes actually look like. And we can use the plot events function for this. So again, these are all the passes that the home team attempted that the pitch control model perceived as having less than a 50% chance of being successful. The home team were always shooting from right to left. And I think the first striking thing is you can see that the passes that originate in the home team's own half tend, tend to be quite long passes, at least uh, 30 or 40 meters in length. And of course, these passes, you know, they may be clearances, they may be goal kicks, um, have a lower chance of success. And then the other set are passes that um, are in the attacking third of the field, often into the penalty area. And presumably, these are passes into crowded locations where the likelihood of success is going to be much lower. Finally, we can take a quick look at what happened immediately following those risky passes by looking at the, the first event that follows each of those passes. And this is what this little loop does here. It's just going to go through the first 20 most risky passes and, and print the following event. And you can see that in in over, well over half of these case of the the most risky passes the following event was either a, a challenge so essentially a tackle or the ball was simply lost by the by the home team so even though the pass was completed they didn't necessarily retain possession very long you can also see that there's quite a lot of shots in here as well as we've seen many of these risky passes were passes into the penalty area so I hope that this video has given you a bit of an insight into how pitch control models can be implemented um, and the insights they can help give into the decisions that a player makes during a game, the options that were available and the probability of success. There are clearly many limitations to the model that we built today, um, many ways in which they can be extended but at least they provide a foundation and an interesting tool for looking at the way the game of football is played. So finally, I'll leave you with some homework tasks. The, the main task is to see if you can get the pitch control model working yourself and begin to generate pitch control services for some of the other events in the, the two matches that Metrica have made available. The more advanced challenge is to consider how you might use pitch control model to calculate 
how much space was created or equivalently how much territory was captured by an off the ball run. And of course, one of the applications of pitch control models is to begin to quantify the actions of players off the ball. This piece of homework is a, a step towards achieving that. Thank you very much. Thank you.